When I think jungle vibes, anthuriums always come to mind. They're large leaves, those mesmerizing vein patterns on so many of the species. They're long, slim stems and those gorgeous flowers. Man, anthuriums just have this prehistoric look that elevates any room and any plant collection. And there is so much more to the world of anthuriums besides the general one that you see in the grocery store with the red flower. Man, there's such a wide variety of species of anthurium. So today, I am so excited to welcome back the queen of the aeroids, Enid from NSE Tropicals to do a deep dive on anthurium care and all my kooky questions about them. I'm so excited to share this conversation with you guys. Welcome to episode 115 of Blue Mango Radio. We are supported by Territorial Seed Company. Plant Friends, Territorial Seed Company is the go-to option for seeds and plants for your garden this summer. They are enabling gardeners to produce an abundance of good tasting, fresh from the garden food 12 months a year with their unbelievable selection of seeds and plants that they extensively test to ensure they yield the best tasting, best producing, highest quality vegetables, flowers, and herbs. It is truly unbelievable how many options they have on their website. Check it out for yourself, all their seeds, plants, garden planners, and more at TerritorialSeed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off your order. Once again, BLOOM10 gets you 10% off at TerritorialSeed.com. Plant friends, I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks as per usual. By now, you know that Billy and I have moved. We are enjoying so much more space in our new home. There'll be more to come, more details, more tours on YouTube. So make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel so you don't miss any tours because, man, our new home is real pretty. (laughs) And with our new home comes more space. And for the first time in what literally feels like forever, I feel like I can finally start thinking about increasing my plant collection instead of decreasing it (laughs) because 2020, I had to half my plant collection because of our move. It's interesting when I think about my new wishlist plants, they're actually very different than my wishlist plants when I had initially started out collecting. And I'm feeling very drawn to Anthurium and Alocasia specifically because of that prehistoric jungle vibe, man, that they just bring to any room. And I just feel like Anthuriums and Alocasia and even Philodendrons, the ones that have those big leaves on the thin stems, I mean, don't you just feel like they're a bunch of little aliens just looking right at you? I just think they're freaky alien plants and I'm obsessed with them. Sorry if that's weird, but it's my truth and I have to tell you. So yeah, I'm all about them lately. And our community is also all about Anthurium and Alocasia because they were highly requested episode topics in our 2020 listener survey. And when thinking about who would be the right guest, I couldn't think of a better guest than Enid of NSC Tropicals. Now you might remember Enid from our two-part series on aeroids way back when. We'll link them in the show notes if you're interested in listening. But NSC Tropicals is like one of the go-to online providers of rare plants. Enid is amazing. She's kind of a one-woman show in Florida growing all these plants. And when it comes to this conversation about rare plants and their increasing demand, I think it's important to always know who you buy from. And Enid is just the best. And lots of people in our community buy from her. Because she grows these plants, she is so freaking knowledgeable about them. So she's actually going to show up on the podcast twice, today and then next month. We're talking anthuriums today. And next month, she's going to come back for a conversation about Elocasia. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on your preferred podcast player so you do not miss the Alocasia episode because both of them are so freaking good. And I am so inspired and making a very long list of anthuriums and alocasias that I want. So if anyone has anthuriums or alocasia you want to swap with me or share with me, please let me know. Before we dive in, if you're liking the podcast these days, I would be so very thankful if you hopped over to the review section of your preferred podcast player and gave us a review and five stars. Those ratings actually really help us within the iTunes podcast algorithms to bring our show to more people. So it's a free way for you to support the show that takes less than five minutes of your time. So thank you in advance for leaving us a review. I really Really appreciate it. All right, guys, get ready. Anthuriums, here we come. Here's Enid. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio, Enid. I'm so happy to have you back. 
Thanks. Great to be here. It's been, I guess, you were episode, you were in the 40s. So it's been definitely over a year, maybe even two years since our last conversation. And your first two-part episode was on aeroids, which was absolutely amazing, but so chock full of information that I felt like we needed to return and break down the aeroid family a little bit more. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> So Enid, for those of us who don't know you already from that episode, do you want to just give us a quick rundown of who you are and what NSE Tropicals is? I'm Enid from NSE Tropicals. I started it in 1999, so it's been 21 years now. And I basically started out propagating plants from my own collection in order to buy more plants. And here I am. 21 years later. 21 years. I try to grow just unusual plants and things that I'm really interested in. I have to say, NSE Tropicals is probably one of the go-to places for rare plants in the United States. When I source my listeners for where are you guys getting plants, who are your favorite growers, who do we want to support, you always come up and you are just such a beloved figure in our community. So I'm so thankful to have you back on the show to do an even deeper dive. Oh. (laughs) So, okay. Anthuriums. They're definitely having a moment right now. They've always kind of been having a moment, but as this rare plant interest in our community soars and as people have been home and really wanting to find those jungle vibes in their homes, I feel like anthuriums are an amazing opportunity to get that prehistoric jungle vibe in your house. Absolutely. They have large leaves and so many different textures and colors and veining. And you can really, even with only anthuriums, you could just have such a different group of plants. Yeah. I mean, they're amazing, especially the veins, man. That clarinervium or, I mean, we're going to dive into all the different types, but man, I look at those. I feel like they're a very Instagrammable plant for sure. So can you tell us a little bit about where anthuriums live outdoors and some history and what we should know about these plants and how they naturally live before we try and bring them indoors? Well, that can be part of the problem for beginners growing them indoors. They're mostly from Central and South America living in humid conditions. I mean, some may be a little drier. You mentioned Clarinervium. That comes from a drier area. Trying to recreate humidity and understory light and where they would be in nature. So that could be kind of difficult without like a terrarium situation. But so many people are doing such an amazing job these days. I, I see these pictures online and I'm like, wow, they have really done it for the plants. Like they wanted these plants and they made it happen in these conditions. And I've seen such a huge difference from a few years ago with people like, I want this plant. I want it right here on my bookshelf. It's not maybe an optimal spot, but now they're like, they got the lights and they've got humidifiers and they're making it happen. And these plants are growing better. I'll see pictures and like, you're growing that you know, in those conditions and the plants are just happy as they can be. So that's really cool to see. That's amazing. Yeah. The Ikea greenhouse cabinet is definitely having a moment. I feel like on Instagram. Look, I just mentioned that in the book. I was like, there's this Ikea cabinet everyone's using right now. Everyone and their mom has been setting up the Ikea cabinet. I have a lot of FOMO. Yeah. Okay. So Central South America. So you're, by saying that you mean very humid, so they like a more humid environment. Yeah. Okay. Are they like Monstera, where they're like growing on the bottom of the jungle floor in humidity as well? Uh, It depends on the variety. I mean, some of them are up in the trees. Some of them are growing epiphytically. Some of them are growing in the ground and then growing up a tree. But I was in Ecuador a few years ago, and one of the things I thought was really interesting is sometimes those aerial roots, the plant isn't even in soil. The plant isn't even in soil. It's just got aerial roots like on this tree, in this bush, one thrown in a bromeliad, like it's not in dirt, like we're trying to make them all fit and stay compact. But if you see them in the jungle, they're not even really in soil. They're just kind of hanging on to everything around them. So this is probably why they're easy to rot in indoor conditions as well, because they're not just plugged into a pot of dirt in nature. Interesting. So their roots are more comfortable being exposed to air more than in a pot. Air and moisture air and moisture. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's funny to see pictures of these plants that are so hard to keep indoors well, like a maidenhair fern or an anthurium. And then you see a picture of them outdoors, like growing out of a crack, or like you said, like hanging onto a tree and being like, why do you thrive anywhere outdoors? And you're just miserable in my home. (laughs) I saw this one anthurium when we were in Ecuador. I tried to grow this little corrugated anthurium 
for years and just could never grow it. It doesn't like it. It's too hot here. Mm -hmm. So over there, I get out of the car and they had had a mudslide and this thing has slid down the mountain and is in the road and they've black topped over it in exposed. Okay. It's not hot. It's the higher elevation. So it's much cooler and humid and everything, but it's been black topped over and it's still growing. And I'm like, I have the perfect situation. I have you in the best soil with the best fertilizer and I love you and you will grow in after being paved over. After being paved. <laughs> full exposure, like cars running over. <laughs> How rude. <laughs> well, I have a, a picture of that too. I'm like, what are you doing? I wanted to move it. Like, get out of the road. <laughs> That's amazing. You should have just gone and took that cutting right then and there. Well, I would have killed uh, it if I came home. <laughs> right. It was too happy, right? How could you even bring yourself to disturb it? Because it was just thriving in the freaking blacktop. That's hilarious. <laughs> Okay. So you mentioned how you've got the perfect setup for the plants that you grow and then sell online. Obviously our indoor setups are going to be a little bit different, but I'd love to dive in to Anthurium Care with you for those of us who are brave enough to bring these little plant babies home. With Anthurium, I feel like people talk about growing media a lot. So what would you suggest as the right growing media setup for an Anthurium if we were to bring one home? Generally for anthuriums and aeroids in general, but specifically anthuriums, they need like a chunky mix. They need orchid bark and charcoal. And if you can get some of that, there's some sustainably harvested tree fern now that's coming out of New Zealand. Tree fern's always awesome. You've really got to have an aerated mix because anthuriums in general, they like water, but they don't want to be wet. They don't want to sit wet. They want to be watered. They would like it to kind of run through. And a friend of mine was telling me that grows indoors. He said he found that the medium being drier, but the plant having more humidity has really worked for him. So if you could increase the humidity, but yet have a drier mix, because wet mix just doesn't dry in an indoor situation as you know as well. And when you say chunky, by adding that orchid bark, that tree fern, you're making it possible for the water to run through the soil faster, get a little moist to give the roots what it needs, but not stay. If you have a soil that's like super compost heavy or super like organic material heavy, then that absorbs water really quickly and then holds on to it. Am I right? That's why you're going to incorporate that other stuff in there? Correct. Yeah. They like that watering, but then they just don't want to be sitting there. And it depends on your situations. Like if you're living somewhere that's a little more humid, you would need less water. Like if you're trying to compare growing with your friend who lives in Utah and you're maybe living in Georgia, you've got different conditions even in your house. So you kind of just got to get to where you're looking at your own plants and you know what they need. You know, well, I don't normally water until Saturday, but yeah, I can see that the leaves are drooping and maybe could use a little more water right now or the other way. Like, wow, the soil's still wet and it's time to water, but if it's still wet, it's not time to water. Oh man, I can relate to that. I have plants on a windowsill that sits above a radiator right now. I can't water them fast enough. They're also tiny pots. They're like little plants in tiny pots that fit on a windowsill. And their soil dries out so fast that I'm actually watering them more in the winter than I am in the summer, which is so counterproductive. But they're shriveling so much faster because they're just sitting right on top of that like dry heat. I've got to move them. But at this point, I don't have any place to move them to. So they're just adjusting. (laughs) That's a nice idea too, to increase humidity. People will take like a plate and put gravel in it and then fill that with water. And that helps Mm -hmm. with humidity. And then also if you're setting the pot on that, it's going to be kind of wicking up water into the soil as well. So that can really help. Yeah. I've tried that. And also putting just like little glasses of water in between each pot. So the water evaporates. So I've been playing with everything. It worked okay. I'm also honestly in just a season of life where I've got so much going on. I can't baby my plants as much as I've wanted to and we're moving. So I'm like, they'll deal with it until we get to our new house and then I'll kind of resuscitate everyone. <laughs> I'm not being... about my stuff when you say I have the perfect conditions and like, well, they all need to get along because the water comes on and everyone in there is getting watered. I'm not like, sometimes I go, wow, why is this one dry? Because maybe a leaf blocked it, but there's so many plants that have to live together. Maybe that one's getting too much water and that one's not getting enough, but there's thousands of them and they need to get along and they need to accept what I'm offering, you know? Totally, totally. So when do you water again with the soil? Do you let the soil completely dry out and then water it again? Or anthurium, someone who likes more of a like consistently moist situation? I'd say a little more consistent. They have these really fleshy roots 
And if you let them completely dry out, sometimes you just cause damage to little to the roots themselves. And it's difficult for them to take up water in the future. But I, you just kind of get an eye for it after a while. You like What I generally do is kind of like stick my finger way down in the soil. And it mm-hmm. leaves the first few inches need to be dry. Like you say, oh, it's dry. But if you stick your finger in there, that soil is still wet. So you just got to yeah. be careful. You're not just constantly watering and rewatering. Totally. I've just been playing around with some moisture meters, which people I feel like are very on the fence about moisture meters. But for my larger pots, they have been helpful because you can stick them so deep into the soil to just even get a little bit of- Way farther than you could get your finger. Exactly. And for the moments where I'm like, I just want to check this really quick before I like run out the door and I don't want soil all under my fingernails, which most of the time I'm always very excited to have. Okay. So we want them in a quick drying soil. I'll say lately what I've been loving is I work with the Spoma Organics. They have all sorts of different potting mixes and I'll take their orchid mix and I'll mix it into their potting mix because the orchid mix is all far, like everything you just listed like is in their orchid mix. So I've been like a mad scientist and like mixing all my own little mixes out of their potting mixes, which have been really fun. They've got some great products too. I really like a lot of their products. So yeah, shout out. (laughs) Love you, Spoma. (laughs) So we're going to mix a nice airy potting mix so that will drain very quickly, but retain a little bit of moisture. And then we're going to water when it's about, you said, like when the top two inches kind of dry out, but not the whole pot. Right. You don't want the thing tumbleweeds blowing across the pot before you water, but kind of just get an eye for when it's starting to dry out, but not completely dry, if that makes any sense. You mentioned humidity. So let's talk about humidity a little bit. Would you recommend some sort of humidifier? Like what percentage do you think humidity-wise anthuriums want to live in? Indoors, I've found that a lot of people are doing with less. The plants kind of get used to the conditions they're in. Mm -hmm. Generally, I'd say 70 to 85 or so in nature or Mm -hmm. outside. Indoors, I've had people telling me they're growing in 50 to 60, which like to me seems very low, but Mm -hmm. the plants look fabulous. So somewhere in there, they like a decent amount of humidity. I mean, you don't want them soggy or anything, but Mm -hmm. they like a decent amount of humidity. And there seems to be a lot of different humidifiers right now. Again, I see pictures and videos. I'm like, that's an amazing setup. Yeah, I want that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Totally. I've been playing with hygrometers, hygrometers. I don't know how to pronounce it. The thing that measures your humidity in your house. And They say like for humans, like 30 to 60 is like what you want to shoot for, not below or not over. And our home right now is like at a 28 to 29 on the daily basis. And my plants are doing fine, but I'm like, wow, this is dry for them. So I'm definitely interested in starting to experiment with some humidifiers and like pebble trays. And I've never really messed with my humidity before. And I'm really interested in playing with it this time around. Because I think it's also good for your lungs as long as the water is clean and your humidifier is clean, you know? Okay. Let's talk about light. What kind of light do anthurium need? And are there across the genus of anthurium, are there different types of anthurium that need different types of light or is it pretty much a blanket amount of light? In nature, most of them are understory plants. There's a few varieties that might be able to take more sun, but I find generally a good rule of thumb is the green leaves can take more light than the velvet leaves. The velvet leaves are normally in the understory. They're in a lot darker conditions in nature than the the, the big green stuff can take more light. That's so interesting. So the velvet leaf varieties are the ones that are the super dark jungle floor. Is the velvet like some sort of adaptation? I was just reading about that the other day where they say that, yes, and also sometimes things with purple backs, if you have plants, Mm -hmm. purple backs, they're trying to get more light. There's something that comes from a darker environment and that helps to reflect the light. And I just thought that was so interesting. And I noticed, oh, like it's got a purple back and like that is something that grows in a darker environment. So interesting. So that's interesting because I feel like for a lot of us that have more indoor environments with bright indirect light, medium light, or low light, it sounds like these plants are good for that kind of lighting setup because they like that bright indirect moment. It's just the figuring out the humidity and the water soil, which is, I guess, where people get stuck. Absolutely. And then air circulation too. That's important because I find even here, I have a greenhouse that has plastic sides and a plastic top. The mm-hmm. plants do not do as well in there, even though it's way more humid as the open air. So I have three shade houses that just have screen. 
So they get rain, they get sun, they get whatever. And they've got all the circulation in the world. And there's a lot less, for me, there's a lot less problems with like fungus or bacteria or anything in the open ones than in the closed. Things like a giant terrarium. And if, if any pest or fungus gets in there, it's like a giant petri dish in there so yeah definitely like i've even done experiments i'll take seedlings and put them in there and do them in the open air ones and they do so much better in the open air shade houses but only have so much space on those benches that is so interesting but it also makes so much sense because when you think about where these plants thrive outdoors and the differences between how they're thriving indoors one of the big things that i feel like especially beginner plant parents don't take into consideration is the air and the air quality and not just the humidity aspect of it but the fact that a lot of us are living in apartment buildings or the biggest draft they're going to get is like whatever forced air we have and if you think about the jungle they've got freaking hurricanes with wind <laughs> and they've just got wind and wind I mean, I've been learning in seed starting, like wind is what makes plants hardy. Like having that air circulation when you're starting your seeds is like what makes the plant resilient and hardy. So of course, plants that aren't getting that might be more susceptible to a lot of stuff. And you make a good point about that Ikea greenhouse or that terrarium where, man, if one plant goes down, everybody's going down. Oh yeah. Because it's just enclosed. and Yeah, totally. That's so interesting. Plan friends, it is seed starting season. It is garden planning season. And whatever you need in regards to your gardens this summer, Territorial Seed has you covered. Territorial Seed Company is where it's at if you're interested in gardening the summer plant friends. I'm so excited to be partnering with them for our seeds, for our garden that we're currently working on. I've been pouring over their online catalog to figure out what we're going to grow. I seriously want every variety of cherry tomato that they have available, but they have 28 varieties of just cherry tomatoes. So my question is how many tomatoes are too many tomatoes? You know what I mean? The cool thing about Territorial Seed Company is that they are their own large largest seed supplier. They produce around 25% of the seeds that they sell on site. So you can really trust that you're getting the goods from them. And the varieties produced in their distinct environment lead to more hardy, vigorous, and productive crops. Territorial Seed Company is best known for the highest quality seeds available on the market, which I'll be doing seed starting with, but they also actually grow and ship seedlings of pre-grown plants of tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, herbs, and flowers directly to your door. So if you can't seed start this year, but you still want those high quality, lots of varieties of plants, check out their website and order their seedlings. The plants are sustainably grown in their custom-made soil and inoculated with super beneficial mycorrhizae. These healthy and robust plants will arrive in custom-designed plant-safe boxes that help ensure perfect delivery. And if you really want to take the guesswork out of maybe trying your first seed starting experience, you can try their no-brainer urban container collection. Collection. It's an all-in-one package, so you get a selection of easy-to-grow vegetables that you can directly sow into the container that it comes with, and it comes with the planting mix and the fertilizer. So you order one thing, and you get everything you need to sow, grow, and harvest some delicious plants. I mean, how freaking cool is that? Also, they're covered by a 100% guarantee, so there's no risk if something goes wrong in shipping. So get a jump start on the season with over 160 varieties of plants from Territorial Seed delivered right to your door. You can check out their catalog and everything they have available on their website at territorialc.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off your order. Once again, that's 10% off with code BLOOM10 at territorialseed.com. In an apartment situation, bright indirect light, I don't mean like up against a window that's getting west sun or direct. Like generally, I feel like if you ever touch a leaf and it's hot, yeah. That's too much. They shouldn't be getting hot when you touch them. And I, I'll have that in my place. Like right now it's 85. Well, I think it's raining, but generally right now it's 80, 85 degrees outside. And you think it's supposed to be winter, but as soon as it starts getting hot for real, you can go out there and you touch a leaf. And even though they're under shade, the leaves are hot. And you're like, this can't be good for these, these plants. Wow. I've never heard that before. Touching the actual leaf. I love that. What a fun way to engage with your plant as well. <laughs> like to engage another sense with your plant when taking care of it. I love that tip. It absolutely helps you get to know the plants better. I mean, I don't mean over there rubbing the leaves and harassing them and getting bacteria from your hands on them and ripping them and stuff like that. But it's hard to take care of them, especially if people have hundreds of plants in their houses now. There's no blanket 
way to take care of everything. You've really got to be like looking at them and flipping over the leaves. And that's where if you're going to have pests, it's going to be under the leaves usually or down in the leaf axils or something like that. So to me, like right now, I've had a little bit of time to go out there and actually look at the plants and Mm -hmm. just find problems before they become terminal. And it's just a great relaxing way to just kind of enjoy your plants, actually looking at each plant and you know, having a moment with it. You're talking my language. (laughs) I love that. Okay. So anthuriums and troubleshooting. We've got some listener questions for you. My big troubleshooting that I just don't freaking understand is anthuriums have these sexy, big leaves and these skinny stems. I just don't understand how they stand up. And I know sometimes people talk about the leaves being droopy. It's a big reason why I've been so intimidated about anthuriums is just like the sheer structure of the plant. So what should we be looking for if our plant starts wilting or not looking very happy? Oh, well, I mean, see, that's where kind of watching your plants comes in because it could be that they're dry, but it can also be that they're too wet because once you've damaged the roots or they're starting to rot, it would look very much, especially to a beginner, like the plant is wilting, it needs more water, but in reality, you've already rotted the roots and they can't take up the water. So there's that. And then if it's not in enough, sometimes if they're not in enough light, they might be droopy. But when you've been growing them for a while, like you could probably now that you've been doing this for a while, look at your plant and go, oh, it's dry. Or, mm-hmm. you know, what I mean? you get to where you can kind of look at it from across the room and know what's wrong with the plant. And to touch on the things with the big leaves, a lot of times those in nature, those would have these big, long aerial roots and they would be kind of like tethering themselves to other plants and trees. And they're like this, grabbing on to other things to support themselves. But when we've got them in indoor conditions, maybe they don't have anything to grab or they're not producing aerial roots, maybe due to humidity or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they would follow as another thing is we expect them to grow straight up and where we want them to grow. But Again, if you're out looking at the plants where they're growing, they have fallen over and grow. They go like this and then go up here and then hang on to something else. And so it's pretty cool that they might have six feet of trunk and growing in an S shape, which would be inconvenient for us. Yeah. I gave you two feet of space. It's all you get. You can't fall over and then grow back up the bookshelf kind of thing. So they normally would kind of fall over and start back up somewhere else. Yeah. Are there any pests that anthuriums attract that people should look out for? I would say the standard ones like thrips, mealybugs, spider mites Mm -hmm. are the big three. And again, you just kind of looking at those leaves and looking at the backs of the leaves. I find mealybugs like to get down in where the new, most stuff loves new growth. Mm -hmm. It's all tender, I guess. They like to get down there and catch those leaves while they're coming out. Mm -hmm. What pest control do you do for your plants? I mean, you're obviously going to do it on a much larger scale than we do, but... I really try not to spray anything unless I see something. And then also, generally, I will take the leaf off. That's just me. Okay. I mean, if it's bad, because I just don't want it to spread. And I also, I'm out there all day. I don't want to spray experimental poison all over my environment where I'm working. So yeah, part of it too. But generally I'll just use something like insecticidal soap if there's a problem I try. And then I have a lot of friends I send plants to that are doing terrariums and frogs. I can't put like DDT on something and have it. Of course. Frogs. Yeah. Again, the houses that are more open, there's not usually too much of a problem maybe caterpillars here and there, but the open houses seem to take care of themselves a little bit better. Now I have an iguana problem. I didn't have, (laughs) you guys won't have iguana pests in your apartments, but we have a lot of invasive species here. And I just started getting iguanas in the last year and they get into my greenhouse and in my houses and eat seedlings. And Oh my God, that sounds awful. They're so cute, the baby ones, but they've got no respect at all. They'll take a whole uh, tray of seedlings and just <gasps> mow it. Yeah. Oh my God, that's terrible. It is. <laughs> now, I'd love to ask about fertilizing. And I wanted to tell you, one of our Patreon plant friends is a super fan of yours. His name is Jeff Shang, and he's oh, bought cool. from you a lot. And he wanted to say thank you so much for the quality of your plants. And he's gotten a lot of his collection from you. And he had two fertilizing questions for you. So before I ask you Jeff's questions, what's like general fertilizing practices with Anthurium? Generally use NutriCoat a couple times a year. Actually, when I first pot something, I'll mix a little bit in the soil and then a little mm-hmm. later in the growing season. I'll top dress a little bit. And I've also been using this product called Max C, 
SEA and it's got a lot of trace minerals and stuff like that in there. It's not as an immediate a boost, but it's kind of like the difference between you eating right and then maybe also taking vitamins kind of thing. It just it's great for the health of the plant in general. I find that the plants just seem a little more robust. So I've been using that a little bit. So you put the granules that you mix into the soil and then they release the fertilizer every time you water, basically. Right. And they're heat activated as well, the NutriCoat. Mm-hmm. For me, I have to be careful in the summer. I've got to use only a little bit. Okay. Because it's going to dissolve faster. Thank you for referencing your fertilizing schedule for Jeff. The other more general question is about open pollination and hybridization of anthuriums. She mentioned that she stores pollen in her freezer. How does she do her own pollination and best tips on that? Why do you do that? I've never even heard of that pollination. I mean, I've heard of pollination, but why are you pollinating anthuriums to grow more anthuriums? To get seed. Okay. So I would rather just do species. I don't always have two inflorescences to do that. And sometimes it seems like a waste, but yeah, I don't want to create too many mutts either. Like I have this really cool crystallinum hybrid that I got from Fairchild Botanical Gardens. And it's just amazing. I don't know if you've seen it on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then I had Anthurium luxuriums that had pollen on it about a month ago. I did a little video of the pollination and I'm like, well, I can't let that luxuriums pollen go to waste, but I didn't have a receptive uh, flower. So I put it on that plant and I just planted some of those seeds. We'll see what they end up looking like. So it could be really cool or kind of water down both parents, sometimes the resulting babies. But I generally just pollinate with fresh pollen because I'm not organized enough to actually properly save it. And usually you just put it in like wax paper and put it in a Ziploc bag and put it in the freezer because pollen has to be fresh. So that's why you would save it. If you maybe had a plan for what you wanted to pollinate, freezing it or refrigerating it is a good idea. Do you have to cross, sorry, this is like such a dumb question, but I don't understand how this works. So say I have an anthurium that flowers and it has pollen. If I wanted to do it myself, do I cross pollinate it with itself with other flowers or do I need to have a separate plant that also flowers and has pollen and then you swap those two pollens on each other? So you need two inflorescences. You need what they call a receptive female Mm -hmm. inflorescence and it'll have this little stigmatic fluid on there like little droplets. So usually once it's got pollen, it's too late to get seeds on that inflorescence. Okay. When it's receptive, it's got little water, like looks like little dew drops all over it. And you take pollen from a separate flower inflorescence and put it on that one. Got it. A separate flower on a separate plant? It can be the same plant if you've got more than one on. Okay. So I just did that with uh, Dresslery. I had like five inflorescences at one time and kind of just like pollen from this one on this receptive one. And, and that's another thing I really like to do that I don't always have time for. But if I'm walking around out there, because you kind of have a small window when something's receptive, it's usually a day or two. If you had a plan to pollinate it, if you're not walking around out there every day, you're missing it if you're not looking at your plants. Got it. That's so cool. So then if the pollination is successful, it'll go to seed and then you save those seeds and then you plant them, germinate them, and then grow separate plants. That's the whole end result. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. And the seeds can take, so this is what's difficult too. The seeds can take anywhere from like three months to two years to ripen, especially in the case Clarinervium. Again, that takes a couple of years sometimes. It's like forever, but they produce bigger seeds. So maybe that's why. And then once you get that seed in your germination setup, how long does it take for you to grow a plant to have it be large enough to sell? I used to say it took a couple of years, but now so many people want to start out when they're small and enjoy watching them grow. So, I mean, it can be a season, like generally for me, they set seed in the winter, which can be quite annoying. Like the flower and the seed is ripe in like this time of year. Mm. And um, by summer, they're four inch pots. And wow. they're looking good, but sometimes it's hard to ship those little plants like that. You really got to use some floss in there and wrap it up in a pillow to keep it from getting damaged. But it is a lot of fun. And the plants can get better used to your conditions when they're young, as opposed to like trying to take some big mature plant and putting it in completely different conditions when it's grown. So smart. So I tend to like that seedlings will grow up in their new environment too. So that's kind of cool. 
That's so cool. Well, I feel like we could dive really deep on that. That sounds like a whole separate episode on pollination. So before we wrap up, I had asked you to come with three recommendations for anthuriums for beginners and then three recommendations for anthuriums for like advanced plant parents who are maybe looking for rare options. So what would you suggest for a plant parent like me who's been a little intimidated at anthuriums but really wants that prehistoric look in their apartments or homes? What species would you suggest? I'd say again, Clarinervium, that seems to do really well indoors. Mm-hmm. A lot of people do well with crystallinum inside. Oh, yes. All my wishless plants you're mentioning. <laughs> what about like the anthuriums, the bigger ones that almost look like Monstera? Isn't that an anthurium? They have like big leaves that go like this. There's a lot of stuff like Podophyllum, which is a really cool one. It's got like a yeah. spider web type of leaf that does really well indoors. That's a really neat one for like texture and it's just a really mm-hmm. good plant. So that's a really good one for indoors as well. Okay, cool. So for easy, we'll do Clarinervium, Crystallinum, and Podophyllum. And then what about three more rare, maybe more high maintenance or needs more expertise to care for? Well, of course, I have to bring Anthurium Warocreanum into that. That's like okay. neat Anthurium. It's just a beautiful plant when it's grown well and it can be so difficult for real. It's like, you're like, I got it. It's growing great. And the next day you walk out and it's collapsed and you're like, what? <laughs> oh no. Okay. So that's one for sure. And then see, I'm trying to think of what doesn't do well for me. A lot of that, like for me, high elevation things, like a lot of the little corrugated stuff doesn't do well for me. Or maybe not even that it has to be hard, but maybe just something that's more rare that someone wouldn't necessarily pick up like in a plant shop, like something they would have to like look harder for. I see a lot of people lately looking for Dreslery and Warocreanum and Regale is another one, big velvety plant that all three of them can be difficult, but not really first timer plants, the kind of plants that like you work your way up to, you know? Yeah. You mentioned luxurians too, which I feel like I've seen a bunch on Instagram. And that plant used to be nowhere. And then all of a sudden you start seeing them available. Like where the heck are those coming from? So yeah, pretty cool to start seeing so many more things out there available. Totally. Well, I know that at some point you have all these plants on your store and so many other amazing things, more than just Anthurium. So where can everyone come find you and see what you're offering and learn from you on Instagram and all those good things? Well, the website is nsetropicals.com and Instagram is just nsetropicals. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see what you're selling because I'm ready. I'm ready for some more anthuriums in my collection. I get geared up for spring and start making some more plants. Exactly. (laughs) Thank you so much, Enid. Sure. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so very much to Enid for this amazing episode. I'm obsessed with that anthurium clarinervium. Like literally all the plants she suggested, I'm like, yes, I want that. Yes, I want that. Yes, I want that. Like I said, I just love these plants. I think they look so cool. Ultimate urban jungle vibes. And make sure you're subscribed because our alocasia conversation, alocasias are like my super wishlist plant. I'm really obsessed with them right now. We have a deep dive and it is so fun. She is so freaking knowledgeable. So thank you again, Eated. Make sure to go to nsctropicals.com to see what she's growing and selling. She always has the most interesting plans. She's clearly so passionate about what she does. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to all of my Patreon plant friend supporters. You guys are the best. Our Patreon plant friends are our community of listeners who support the show on a monetarily basis monthly. It means the world to me that people in our listener community actually want to support the show and help me get the show to as many planty ears and eyes as possible. So thank you. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you can check the link in the show notes to learn more about becoming a Patreon plant friend. Until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show. So thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content 
or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Planned Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality, and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at bloomandgrowradio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month, and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing.